Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and my guest today for our discussion is Professor George Katrugalos, Alternate Foreign Minister of Greece and of course former Labour Minister of Greece. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Greece may be a small European country, but in India it um, is a country which arouses a great deal of interest, not just for historical or cultural reasons, but also because last year uh, the entire crisis, the Greek financial crisis and the a referendum and the manner in which the Greek electorate in a way uh, sought to reject the kind of pressure that were being put on the Greek government uh, as part of the debt repayment crisis. Uh, this is something which all of us here followed very closely and maybe we can start our interview mm -hmm. with, uh, with you providing us uh, a kind of a, a, a quick summary of where things stand now in terms of the um, Greek negotiations with the IMF and with your creditors. Uh, I know that as Labour Minister there was a lot of pressure on you to accept uh, certain uh, conditions which should have made mm -hmm. it more difficult for the trade union movement and mm -hmm. for workers to mm -hmm. engage mm -hmm. in collective bargaining. I know mm -hmm. that your government resisted to that. But where do things stand now in terms of the um, final relations with the IMF and with the uh, EU Troika? Uh -huh. You know, we have been uh, before uh, uh, this crisis against uh, neoliberalism and austerity. And we continue to be against the neoliberalism and austerity. What we have learned during the first uh, administration of ours, that it is not possible to change just one country in Europe. One cannot implement uh, social measures in uh, just Greece without changing uh, Europe. So, although we fought to gain uh, a new mix of policies, we had uh, to succumb to a forceful compromise uh, after uh, a certain, I would say, coup uh, against us that uh, put us in a dilemma. Either we would go for a disorderly default or we would go to this uh, forceful compromise. So, without rejecting our uh, policies, our principles and uh, our rejection to the austerity, now we are forced uh, to work in a very much more complicated situation. We have signed a new MOU, a new Memorandum of Understanding, which is lighter uh, with regard to the austerity measures uh, than the others, but it remains basically a neoliberal program. We have chosen to respect all our engagements, because after all it has our signature yes. below it, <laughs> but to try to neutralize uh, whatever is neoliberal within it with policies of counter, uh, let's say, scoping of our own, and to the extent of, uh, to the possible extent, uh, replace the impact of, uh, not replace exactly, uh, balance the impact of uh, uh, measures of austerity with measures of different uh, orientation. I'm going to give you an example exactly from my old portfolio. We had an obligation in line with what IMF thinks about uh, social uh, expenditure to reduce the pension expenditure by 1% and also eliminate a special allowance that uh, uh, went to the poorest uh, uh, retirees. If we're limited just to these two measures, we would be completely aligned with what we wanted to avoid, that is undermining yeah. of the welfare state. We had to do that. We incorporated, however, these two bad things in a sweeping reform that changed the character of our system in a way that made it fairer and, I think, neutralized the impact of these two measures. What do we have done in other ways? We used to have in Greece a very clientelistic, fragmented system that resulted to a plethora of rules uh, regarding pensions. Mm. Practically every social category had their own uh, uh, formula. We harmonized all these rules. We, have, we are going to have just one single insurance fund and the same uh, uh, formulas, both with regarding contributions and regarding uh, pensions. What is more important? We have established for a first time in Greece a national pension that it is not going to be financed by contributions, but by taxation. Okay. And uh, we have so this, so this will not be industry specific. Exactly. Okay. And do not just that. Uh, it is going to give to everybody the equivalent of the threshold of poverty in Greece. That is, according to the EU standards, 60% of the median income. So in this way. Although that uh, we had uh, to uh, uh, swallow a better pill, exactly, uh, uh. we have not just sweetened it. Okay. We have just we have made a system fairer, 
conform to the principles of the left, equality and uh, social justice. And although that indeed we are distributing a smaller pie because we have reduced the expenditure by 1%, now we are, we are distributing in a very much fairer and uh, uh, let's say, uh, I think, just way. And uh, we had to make uh, the economic readjustment because the deficit of our uh, social pension system was at the order of 4%. So a reduction by 1% would be very probably something that we could have done by ourselves. So just to give you in the summary our uh, signal, now we have a, strat a double strategy. We try to change the long-term political dynamics in Europe, basically to form a new alliance, progressive alliance with the social democrats, mm -hmm. the forces of the central left. Yes. And in Greece, we are trying to implement what we have uh, promised, but not uh, uh, as a program of neoliberal reform. Right. Um, I think you've raised an interesting issue, which is the efforts of Syriza or other center-left parties to uh, create more space for, for the center-left mm -hmm. in, uh, in the EU. But uh, isn't it also true that across the continent, forces of the right and in some cases extreme right are also making headway. Uh -huh. uh, there's now talk in the aftermath of Donald Trump's victory that Marine Le Pen's uh, candidature in France will get a boost. Uh, in other countries too, there are fears. Uh -huh. uh, do you feel that the pendulum has swung decisively to the right? No, no, quite the opposite. Okay. I think that what all uh, these uh, trends uh, that you have described, Trump, but also Bernie Sanders, uh, Le Pen, but also Jeremy Corbyn. So clearly one thing, that the status quo is not defendable. Okay. Even Theresa May has adopted an anti-elite uh, discourse. Language, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, what is clear is, is that contrary to what uh, the neoliberal thinkers believed, that we have the end of the history in front of us, we have actually the end of the triumphing. Uh, uh, neoliberalism. I'm not saying the death uh, of neoliberalism is close, but if you look at the reactions of the society and also of uh, the political establishment parties, it's obvious that the formula does not work anymore, does not produce uh, welfare. And exactly this feeling of uh, the average uh, citizen in Europe and in, uh, generally in the West, that his children are going to have a worse life than his own, it's really what makes the difference. So, in uh, my interpretation, we have now a political vacuum. The establishment parties cannot defend business as usual, as in the past. And this political which vacuum... Is a which is, a, in a, from your point of view, a positive development. Exactly. Yeah. It is a positive development. Yeah. But on the other hand, this political vacuum is still a, an open bet if it is going to be covered by forces of the left or forces that are really reactionary. Uh, in a way, it is a repetition of what's happened in uh, Europe uh, in uh, the mid-war period of the last uh, century, where we had uh, an economic crisis, and instead of adopting, uh, uh, let's say, a program of uh, Keynesian aspiration like uh, New Roosevelt, mm -hmm. in uh, Europe we tried initially to adopt restrictive economic policies to, fi to find scapegoats for this erosion of the middle class uh, to uh, the face of the Jews. Yes. And then, when the unemployment uh, ballooned, we had this uh, terrible uh, birth of uh, fascism and uh, Nazism. So uh, what I'm saying basically is uh, then and now we have a clear choice. Either we are going to opt for pro-social uh, measures, expansive policies, in a way the ones that Obama has followed in uh, the States, or we are going to try to return to a golden past that does not exist. And uh, now, you know, in uh, the place of the Jews, our sca scapegoats are the refugees and the emigrants. Yes. And there is a clear temptation for some political circles in Europe to use them as a kind of uh, scarecrow. Uh, the interesting thing is that the same political cycles uh, that uh, wanted to have these uh, scarecrows also uh, crit are criticizing the neoliberal, uh, let's say, uh, way of thinking. But if one looks closer... Yeah, I mean, the, the, the new right or the hard right often adopt this, uh, a seemingly populist tone. It, it, they talk against big banks, against capitalism, exactly. and so on. But if one looks closer to what they say, usually they are against uh, the big banks if they are abroad, and yes. they are f f for their big banks. If you look, for instance, uh, at the discourse of Madame Le Pen, which is one of the cleverest uh, uh, figures of this trend, she's different than uh, her father. 
she is not adopting the, the same uh, almost uh, neo-fascist uh, discourse. She has this uh, anti-elite, anti-globalization yes. agenda. But if you look at her project, at her program, it is a program that it is against trade unions. It's against the basic uh, compromises that made social uh, state uh, possible. So basically, they are defending the interests of uh, the capital, but of the national Local capital. Local national capital. As the other the national bourgeoisie, as exactly. you use the Marxist phrase. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, last year, there was all this talk uh, in the context of the Greek debt crisis and the pressure from the Troika uh, of the possibility of a Grexit, Greece exiting the European Union. And for a variety of reasons, uh, the Greek leadership and the Greek people didn't go down that path. Uh, what happened instead was one of the <laughs> major uh, economies of the, of the EU, Britain, yes. voted to, yes. uh, to exit. So you, instead of Grexit, we had Brexit. Uh, it's been several months since that vote, which caught the whole world by surprise in, in some ways. Uh, progress towards that goal still seems to be rather slow. I would say, based on what the UK courts have said, based on, you know, it looks like a very complicated and uncertain path. Mm -hmm. But I want you, as, uh, as a Greek politician, as uh, a representative of Syriza, uh, as it were, to uh, give us your perspective on why you think it is that the British electorate voted for Brexit, uh -huh. and whether you think Britain's exit will, will be a smooth affair, and whether this will be ultimately for the good of Europe, or uh -huh. Europe uh -huh. will suffer uh, uh -huh. as a result uh -huh. of this. Uh -huh. You know, usually the, the explanation of, uh, about Brexit is that it is the reaction against migration. Yes. It was a factor that played an important role. However, I think that uh, the basic reason for Brexit is that uh, huge sectors of the British society felt marginalized and excluded from uh, the way of economic uh, progress. This is clear on the way that uh, how different sections of Britain have voted. The North, uh, the decentralized uh, uh, North, uh, when we have all these pictures of, uh, of the films of Ken Loach and, yes. and the others. Yes, exactly. It's clear that there is, is a feeling of not belonging to this uh, neoliberal mantra of success. In a way, Greece and the Brexit are not different in this aspect, because we in Greece do not like this kind of Europe, the, the, the neoliberal Europe. However, instead of choosing to go out of Europe, uh, we have chosen to try to change it. Of course, not by ourselves, a small country in the periphery of, uh, of Europe. But as I said before, trying to forge this kind of alliance, Jeremy Corbyn is a hope in this uh, direction. And this is not just, uh, let's say, in, in our minds. If you look now how the, the balance of forces is in Europe, it is tilting. Uh, for instance, in another country of the South, Portugal, we have this kind of yes. alliance of social democrats and uh, the left. The European Parliament is an interesting uh, uh, workshop where we have already a group of uh, progressives uh, that comprises uh, left, uh, social democrats and the Greens. We have after the elections, the recent elections in Germany and Berlin, a similar coalition, uh, red, red, uh, green as they call it, uh, that is uh, left uh, social democrats. And so I have the understanding that now, mm. more generally in, uh, in Europe, the social democrats have a dilemma. Uh, to express it in two neologisms, pacification or Corbynization. That okay. is, they are going to adopt, if they stay to their strategic alliance with the neoliberals, they are going to evaporate, as it happened to the dominant social the democratic in party Greece, yeah. in Greece, PASOK. If they adopt, uh, adopt a, I would not say it exactly radicalization, but uh, a, a departure from this uh, third way uh, uh, in the Blair. But, but it's interesting you're saying Corbynization and not, serit not seritification. <laughs> uh, okay, we are more extreme. I think <laughs> okay, that, all right. that. okay, okay. Uh, we look more like uh, this coalition of Allende that okay. had from communists to social democrats. Okay. So I think that is a little premature for, okay. <laughs> for Europe. All right. But uh, what, uh, uh, what, uh, why I'm speaking about uh, Corbynization? Because in my mind, is not exactly radicalization. It's uh, going back to the fundamentals of, uh, the lab of the labor. What movement. labor used to be exactly, exactly yeah. before Blair. Yeah. It, it is uh, Blair that changed the yes. shift. Uh, that's why Thatcher was considered, as you maybe remember, uh, her basic achievement, uh, the, the third row of Blair. Exactly because practically derooted uh, a, a whole movement, not just uh, a political party. And I think that now it's uh, one of these crucial moments. Uh, Europe is on the crossroads. There are two different visions for Europe, one neoliberal, one social, and 
contrary to what it is uh, uh, obvious to, to some uh, uh, analysts, I think that both uh, the objective and the subjective conditions favor a turn to the left. Mm. And, and you think that uh, the dynamic following the election of Trump will not affect uh, European politics? Because, uh, I mean, Trump has been unsettling in many ways. Uh, at one level, he reflects the, the dynamic you mentioned earlier of dissatisfaction with business as usual. Mm -hmm. But on the other, uh, it's undeniable that he has given uh, a boost or a lot of encouragement to, you know, rightist, anti-social uh, yes. trends and forces. Yes. Well, I think that the, the, the internal political uh, uh, dynamics would be influenced uh, by, by internal uh, reasons. In a way, it, Trump uh, and even Brexit could be beneficial for strengthening some aspects of the European Union that have been quite at their infancy. For instance, defense policy. Yeah. Yeah, if uh, we have a, a very much uh, isolationist uh, US, presidency. Uh, US presidency, then necessarily yeah. we would have to rely so the on the, forces. The, the common foreign and security, the elusive common, yeah, yeah. common foreign and security policy. Yeah, but, yeah. but to be frank, if we want to succeed that, we must succeed in strengthening our political cooperation that it is not uh, evident now. Exactly because this, visio, this division between uh, these confronting visions of Europe uh, does not allow a common uh, expression in, in Europe. But I think that the imperative exists mm. and we can work on that. Mm. One of the good things of the crisis is that it is that it has created in Europe a kind of common uh, public space. I mean, when uh, Minister Varoufakis or Minister Soible were saying something, it has been translated in all yes. uh, languages simultaneously. And for the first time, we have discourses like that, uh, this on austerity, that on migration, that they are not uh, uh, focused just on some countries. They are horizontal and uh, they, are, uh, uh, they have uh, the same argumentation, not limited to national specifics, but generalized. This is a precondition right. for democracy. Right. I know that uh, Greece's for, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Tsipras, spoke to uh, Donald Trump, the US president-elect, and. Uh, I, I would imagine, as with many other European countries or countries around the world, uh, Greece is wondering what direction U.S. policy will go. Uh, I'm just curious, from a Greek point of view, uh, certain aspects of Trump's stated foreign policy, for example, the need to improve relations with Russia, would be something that Greece would, uh, would say is, uh, is worth pursuing, right? You, you remember the old saying that big countries uh, do not have friends, they have interests. Right. And it is in the interest of uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, policy to have a stable, a politically stable and economically stable Greece in the area, which very much destabilized. I mean, I'm speaking about the, the, near, the near East and the Middle East uh, area. So I, my prognostics is that it is not going to be essentially different, uh, the U U.S. policy towards us. They have tried to help us, for instance, with regard to the debt. They have said the obvious that uh, the, the Greek uh, public debt should be alleviated, okay. despite the resistance of other forces in, uh, in Europe. And uh, good relations with Russia, without, of, of course, succumbing to any kind of uh, blackmails or to aggressive politics, it's also a good thing. Right. Uh, Russia was always a flank power in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. It cannot, be, it cannot be yet be marginalized. Right. And we hoped uh, that we had also in the past the position to act as a kind of uh, bridge right. between uh, Russia and right. Europe. Right. Uh, we have uh, not much time, three, four minutes left. And I wanted to look at Greece's neighborhood uh, with two questions, one on Turkey and the other on the refugee crisis. Very quickly on Turkey was um, I would imagine Greece was as taken aback as the rest of Europe with the attempted yes. coup in Turkey. Yes. Are you satisfied that things uh, have reverted to uh, first of a, all, a, a, a sort of a normality now? And first of all, we have uh, our prime minister was one of the first leaders that communicated with President Erdogan, expressing our uh, opposition to the coup for obvious reasons of principles and because we have been for not many decades ago victims of a military coup. So, in my understanding, every elected government is much better, even with regard to the most uh, enlightened uh, despot, mm. even military or otherwise. Uh, despite that, of course, now Turkey is facing a very peculiar period with uh, 
two different visions confronting each other. One related to its past, uh, the Kemalist military-based uh, tradition. A new one that is more uh, uh, oriented to Islam. We don't know exactly uh, the final mix of policy. And uh, it is in the interest of Europe, but our interest, a stable uh, Turkey anyway. Right. Right. And on the refugees crisis, Greece was the frontline front line state last year and uh, even now in many, in many ways. And of course, uh, the reason for the exodus is the crisis in Syria. Uh, are you satisfied with the um, European, pan-European response? Some countries have been very unfriendly, uh, other countries yeah, yeah, have been receptive. Yeah. Where do you think that's going to go now? I'm very proud of our reaction and really I'm very concerned about the European reaction to that. You know, we have received in the past, we have a, a disastrous war with Turkey in the mid-20s and we have received about 1,500,000 refugees, Greek refugees fleeing from historical uh, uh, Greek areas. And we had, of course, a lot of emigrants. Uh, we, we're still not a rich country, but it used to be a very poor one. And we were sending by millions our uh, citizens abroad. And we remember the time that it was us, the refugees, and us, the emigrants, and that we responded with a very humane way to this crisis. And we cannot do otherwise. Right. On the other hand, it, it is a very disproportionate weight, the one that uh, burden, the, the one that we have now, uh, exactly because the, the, we are the entry point. So, what we are expecting from Europe is to respect the principle of solidarity and what they have decided. Right. Relocation of refugees, right. a, a fair solution. Right. Uh, on that note, uh, Professor, we're completely out of time, but uh, it's been a real pleasure having you and discussing the too. Greek perspective on international affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That wraps up this episode of Indian Standard Time. Uh, do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.